I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody in this church thinks. Those were the words that I heard from across the table. I was counseling a couple. She had asked for some counsel. She said, could you come visit with us because my husband, well, he wants to do things that uh, I'm not so sure about. And come to find out in the process of an hour-long conversation, there were many different relationships that this gentleman was having with other women, and he had convinced his wife that maybe, just maybe, it was okay. But deep down, she felt like something wasn't right, this doesn't seem okay, and so let's talk about it. We sat down to converse, I listened the best I could, and then I gave my counsel, and it was received with, I don't care what you think, slamming his fist down on the table, I don't care what anybody thinks, and well, that was the end of it. We never saw him again. Church discipline, it can take on all kinds of forms, and we encounter all kinds of difficulties in this world. That was Lubbock 2007, and I remember struggling for my words. I remember thinking, what should I say? How should I say it? And what's going to happen next? And I even had a guy waiting outside to protect me just in case. And that was years ago, but if you fast forward, there's another situation involving discipline that even made national headlines. This word discipline can be a scary word for us. It can be an abusive word. Maybe you grew up with an abusive family, uh, parents who were abusive toward you, whether it was physical abuse, emotional abuse, even spiritual abuse or sexual abuse. Many people have a history of this kind of abuse. And so when the word discipline comes up, it can be a very scary word. People talk about church discipline and they think of what happened in Texas in 2015, this national news story that hit the headlines all over the place, there was an abusive church discipline situation. A couple came for counsel. He was struggling with pornography, and she was the victim of that, and she was asked to leave the church because she was considering divorce. And the pornography was pretty graphic. It involved illegal actions. And she had every right to go, whoa, wait a minute. Five years, ten years, fifteen years of that. I don't even know this person. And she was questioning and searching and looking. And they said, you get out of here. You don't belong here. And so he remained in the fellowship and she was asked to leave and the whole thing was turned upside down, and it was so poorly dealt with that the public picked it up, the news, the press picked it up, and it became a horrible embarrassment. Maybe some of you remember that. It leads us to all kinds of questions to consider, doesn't it? What does healthy church discipline look like? What's its real purpose? And then you say, all right, well, that's chapter 5. What happened in chapter 4? Well, we take just a minute to see what chapter 4 is for. We apostles are faithful servants of Christ, Paul says. We're fools for his sake. We're persecuted. We're slandered. We're treated like garbage, he says. There's division and arrogance among you. I will visit you soon to see the situation for myself. And that's chapter 4, which brings us to chapter 5, where we're asking these important questions. How do we avoid abuse? When do we respond to a situation? How do we respond? With what sort of action? Should we just sit on our hands and say, grace, 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 nothing matters? When is enough enough? And wouldn't you agree with me that there's a lack of clarity today on church discipline? 
So it takes all shapes. Perhaps you've heard about becoming a member and then being required to give a certain amount of money and then being under what appears to be the thumb of uh, leadership and it can lead to abuse as it did in Texas in 2015. There are abuses and yet there's healthy discipline. There has to be. Paul calls for it. God designed it in the body of Christ. So what does it really mean? look like? Well, here we begin chapter 5, and Paul answers this question for us. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. Whoa! Wow! Now that is heinous And shockingly evil, wouldn't you say? Paul has said it. This is so extreme that not even the Corinthians around in the community would engage in such behavior. That's how off the charts it is. So I hope you see that because when we see the action taken, we need to see what the offense was in the first place. This was not your common everyday struggle. (laughs) And this was not your common everyday response to a Christian struggle. As we'll see, there was tremendous pride and arrogance and excuse making and this is okay and God is cool with this. That was the attitude in Corinth 2,000 years ago with this man. So... He's taken his father's wife. It's off the charts out there. As we would say in West Texas, that don't happen in these parts, right? And it didn't happen in those parts either. Not in Corinth. No, with its bathhouses, its pagan temples, its all kind of devil worship, if you will. I mean, you talk about a place of total debauchery And yet, taking your father's wife, uh uh-uh, that is out of bounds. And so, this was immorality of such a kind that didn't even exist among those Corinthians. Next, he points out, you've become arrogant. Notice the attitude. You've become arrogant about it. You've not mourned. Instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody thinks. That was the attitude. Sound familiar? The attitude that we encountered here in 2007 and the attitude that Paul is encountering in that congregation. There's no mourning. There's no sorrow. There's no healthy regret. There's only pride and excuse making and saying it doesn't matter because I'm under grace. It doesn't matter because God is good with it. And yet it is blatant sinful activity. Not even done among unbelievers. Wow. So the key attitude here is the lack of remorse. For I on my part... Though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. Now, notice there's a kind of judgment here. Oh, don't judge me. That's what we all find others saying, don't we? Don't judge me. That's judging me. You stop judging me. And yet Paul is saying that there's a healthy place here. For making a judgment call on something. Otherwise, we are a body of Jesus Christ without discernment, without thinking through an issue, and we're all hands off saying, Nothing matters, see you in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for a heavenly Father who cares so deeply about our behavior. This is not God's gonna get you. This is a father who cares about what's happening in his family. I guess I would appeal to the fathers out there in the audience this morning. Do you not care about how your kids are doing? 
if they're biting and devouring and have divisions and bickering, or if they're doing things that harm them, if they've been caught in an addiction, do you not care? Well, this is the very same type of care and even greater care that we see in this passage. And so we see that Paul has made a judgment call, hasn't he? He's made a a, a call very much like you might see in the game of soccer. Yeah. The game of soccer, you've got your yellow card and then you've got your red card. Now, if you've played soccer or watched it being played, you know that a yellow card is your first offense. And then if you have a second yellow card, that equals a red. Now, what that means is we gave you another chance. You were punching people. You were kicking people in the face. You were knocking people over who didn't have the ball. You were instigating fights. You're a troublemaker out there, and so we yellow card you. That's your warning. And then, after two yellow cards, you get a red card, and you're out of the game. Now, you're not off the team. You're not off the team. But you're out of the game because what you're doing is harmful. Do you see the difference? You can't participate in the game today because what you're doing is lethal or harmful or hurtful to other people. And it also hurts our reputation as a team. So we're for you. You'll you'll be on the team. We're ready for you to join us next time. But right now, kind of like a four-year-old, you need a timeout. And so that's what we see in this passage Paul continues with this judgment call. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of our Lord Jesus. Now, what do you see? This guy's a Christian. And that's a big comfort, isn't it? I mean, you talk about the heinous and shockingly evil behavior he's engaged in, and yet the Apostle Paul has the heart, has the courage to write in this letter that this man's spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Oh, he's making a mockery of himself walking after the flesh. I mean, he is doing absurd things, foolish things. His reputation may be ruined for some time. And we're saying, go out there and destroy your life if that's what you want. Go out there and have at it. We'll be here when you're ready to come back and come to your senses. It's a time out. Handing him over to the world where Satan is is lord of that evil world. He's working in the sons of disobedience, and apparently you want to act like someone that you're not. Apparently, you being light want to act like your darkness. You, as a child of light, want to act like someone that you're not, doing things that not even unbelievers engage in. So, what does this tell you? Friend, any Christian can have any struggle at any time. Do you see that? How many times have we found ourselves in a struggle and we're so ashamed of it and the very next thought is maybe I'm not even saved. How could I be a true Christian and yet get this thought? How could I be a believer and yet struggle in this way? And here's a man with his father's wife Something outrageous and outlandishly sinful. And yet, Paul's thought is not, let's get him saved. Paul's thought is not, let's preach the gospel to him. Paul's thought is, this guy needs loving discipline. He needs a time out. He needs to go and see what the world has to offer because it's not much. (laughs) And he's made his choice anyway. So we're going to let him make his choice in hopes that he turns and comes to his senses and comes back. And in fact, we're going to see in 2 Corinthians, you know what happens? That very thing. He is restored to fellowship with the Corinthian believers. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven 
leavens the whole lump of dough. What's he talking about? You know, my wife Catherine, she loves to bake, and with COVID going on and lots of time at home and a lot less travel happening, she's baking a lot. And me and Gavin, well, we love it. And she bakes the best bread. I mean, all kinds of bread. This morning, I sunk my teeth into homemade cinnamon rolls, and they were incredible. I'm sorry I didn't bring any to share. But there's something about baking where you've got to be careful. And if you've engaged in baking, you know what I'm talking about. That bread begins to rise. And if you're not prepared for that rise, and if there's too much yeast, and if there's too much rise, I mean, you might have quite a little situation on your hands there. And Paul is using the idea of bread to show these Corinthians something. What is it? Well, you allow a little bit of yeast, a little bit of leaven, and guess what? Boom! You may have a little explosion on your hands in your congregation. And that is exactly what you've done in standing by passively, not doing anything about what's occurring in the congregation. You have given permission for one little piece of leaven to then ruin the reputation Of the whole lump. I mean, guess what those Corinthians are saying? I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about the people outside the church living in Corinth. Guess what they're saying? Have you heard about that little Jesus group over there? Yeah, apparently they sleep with their relatives. Have you heard about that little Jesus group over there? Yeah, apparently in the name of Jesus... They're all about all kinds of sexual promiscuity and inappropriate relationships. And Corinthians, church, body of Christ, you have allowed this to balloon out of control into something heinous and shockingly evil because you chose to boast and brag and be callous and indifferent and go passive instead of actively caring about this man and his choice And doing what was needed. Your boasting is not good. So what do we see so far? Maybe there's a key concept here. And I hope you've grabbed a hold of it. It's not the idea of standing at the front of the church with a clipboard. And trying to discipline everybody. No, church discipline fosters healthy regret over sin. Not excessive sorrow over failure. Now, we're going to continue to see this this morning. It's going to get clearer and clearer as this passage unfolds. And I would argue that this is not just true for church discipline, where you've got another human involved making a decision. It's true of God's discipline. God's personal discipline of us. God's discipline of us is training for the future, not punishment for the past. And God's discipline of us fosters a healthy regret over sin, not an excessive sorrow over failure. And we're actually going to see Paul say these very words. He is worried that the Corinthians have been too hard on this guy. Do you know that? That's what we're going to see in his second letter. So yeah, deal with him. But hey, be careful with him. Love him. Forgive him, accept him, embrace him, welcome him back. Don't let him engage in excessive sorrow. So, how do we put this another way? In other words, there's good sorry. I knew about that one. But apparently there's bad sorry. (laughs) What does that mean? Well, bad sorry is very different from good sorry. See, good sorry is I'm sorry for what I did... And then bad sorry is, I'm a sorry person. And that's where the enemy wants to take you. The enemy wants to take you to a place of self-condemnation, casting a verdict upon yourself, that you are the sum total of what you do, and therefore you're a sorry excuse for a child of God. Have you ever thought a thought like that? And so, in the world, it's interesting, we see this idea of guilt... And Christian psychologists might tell you, well, it's good to 
feel real guilt, just watch out for false guilt. Well, I would beg to differ on that. This is an interesting point out of Hebrews 10. What about guilt? Well, it says in Hebrews 10 that if the worshipers, the Old Testament worshipers who had the law, if they had been cleansed once for all like us, it says they would no longer have felt guilty Another translation says they no longer would have had consciousness, a conscious record of their sins. So here's where I want to bring us today, and I hope you see it. The average Christian psychologist might offer something like, well, there's real guilt and false guilt. So go with the real guilt, avoid the false guilt. And I would say we're almost there, except the Bible says don't be motivated by guilt. Don't be inspired by any guilt. And so, where is this place, the good sorry? Where is it? Apparently, there's a good sorry that is not about me heaping guilt on me, but it's a good sorry where I recognize that I have a new heart, that Christ lives in me, that I'm dead to sin, that I'm high and lifted up, raised and seated in heavenly places, that sinful attitudes are beneath me, that they're not of me, that they don't define me, that they're not who I am, that I'm made for something better, and that's the motivation for change. And that's the discipline of the Lord. This is not who you are. You're acting like someone you're not. That is very different from, you're a sorry excuse for a child of God. Friend, that is the voice of the enemy, the accuser. Revelation says he accuses you day and night. So we see then there is a good sorry, a healthy regret. Paul continues, he says, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. What's he saying? You're spotless. You're blameless. You're forgiven. So act like it. That's what he's saying. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed once for all. Jesus hung on a cross once. It worked the first time. And now you have a spotless condition, a blameless position a right standing with God that can never be taken and never be shaken in the slightest. And so therefore, act like it. A new lump, he's talking about them collectively. He's not singling a person out here. He's saying, let's all together act like who we are because in fact, you are unleavened. What does the leaven represent here? Remember, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin in the congregation, it can balloon into something dynamically awful. And so what's he saying here? Your record is sinless. I want to repeat that. I want you to see what he said, and I want you to read it again with me. Clean out the old leaven. That's this guy doing this stuff. So that you may be a new lump, not trying to be a new lump, not working hard at being a new lump, just as you, in fact, already are sinless in your record, spotless in your condition, blameless in your identity. Go ahead and act that way. Do you see it? In fact, you already are. So go ahead and behave in a way that is worthy of your calling. There's no down-talking. There's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no pushing people into some manipulative remorse. It is a healthy regret based on your new identity in Christ. Why? Because Christ has been sacrificed once for all, freeing you. There's no condemnation, liberating you from guilt There's no condemnation, but Christ lives in you, and you've got a new heart, and that matters, and you've got a new design. You're built from the ground up to display Jesus. Nothing else will ever satisfy. Amen? 
All right, well, he says, therefore, let us celebrate the feast. Figuratively, he's talking about the Passover feast, but you'll see in a minute he means doing the Christian life. Let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. In other words, let's do life together, but let's do it truthfully. And if we need to call something out like a man who is sleeping with his father's wife, let's go ahead and live together with sincerity and truth. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's not dance around it. Let's not shove it under the carpet. Let's not end up with unhealthy, abusive discipline. Let's not end up with passivity. Let's engage, but out of love and care for this person. They don't even know what they're doing. Deep down at the heart level, they're not made for this. This is not their destiny. He began a good work in that man. He's going to carry it on to completion. So let's engage. Let's be involved. Let's help that along. Let's not go passive and say nothing. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Now, I did not at all mean the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and the swindlers or the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of this world. In other words, you'd have to hit the eject button. And that's not what I said. You'd have to go live on a commune and build a wall around your community and be isolated, get away from the world. Maybe adorn yourselves in robes and separate yourselves as holier or greater than your surroundings. Isolation. Hitting the eject button and saying, I'm out of here. Or instead of putting that finger on the eject button, you point it right at the world and start judging them and saying, why don't you act better? And Paul says, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time judging outsiders. Why don't they act better? Because they're spiritually dead, that's why. Are you really surprised that someone who's in Adam walks after the flesh? Are you really surprised that someone that doesn't know Jesus and doesn't have a new heart, are we really surprised that they're acting different from the church? We shouldn't be. So don't waste your time marching against the evil of unbelievers, pointing your finger and accusing the world of being the world. No, if there's a place for judgment, this is very interesting, if there's a place for judgment, if there's a place for a judgment call, if there's a place for discernment and taking action, it's in our own family. That's what Paul is saying. As painful or as challenging or as uncomfortable as that may be for a church body to hear, it is healthy for us to care about our brothers and sisters and engage. So it's interesting that 1 Corinthians chapter 5 has brought us such challenging new thinking here. He says, actually, I wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother, not an unbeliever, but somebody who's calling themselves a Christian. Don't associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Wow. Don't even eat with him? Well, 2,000 years ago, when you got together and you broke bread with someone, you were publicly associating with them. You were walking across town, visiting their house, having a social night with them. You were saying, I'm like this person, and I'm with this person, and I'm communing with this person, and I'm communicating and, and dialoguing, and we are in a relationship, a friendship, an association. And so what he's saying is, If somebody's using the name of Jesus and they're swindling people out of money, if somebody's using the name of Jesus and they're constantly drunk as a skunk, what what are you you doing? I mean, 
You know, Paul says, I buffet my body. You know, he says that? I beat my body, I make it my slave. Another translation says, I buffet my body. And then he says, lest I be disqualified. And people freak out about that. They think, well, maybe he's talking about losing his salvation. No, he's talking about being disqualified in the eyes of other people. If I stood up here on Sunday morning and I had a, just a little glass of gin right here, just a little gin right here and, I don't know, six or eight packs of cigarettes over here, made my way through them over the next half hour, took a swig of gin, had another smoke, took a swig of gin. Clearly, I've got an addiction. I'm out of control in both regards. I'm drunk. And yet I'm talking about Jesus. How long do you think this church is going to last? you got to get me out of here is what you got to do. You want to last, you got to get me out of here. And so that's what he's saying. Don't associate with any so-called brother. Don't even eat with such a one. If they're swindling people out of money, if they're drunk as a skunk, if they're immoral all the time, don't even associate. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? I'm not going to waste my time. There's seven billion of them. I'm not going to waste my time. Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside, God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Now that's interesting because, again, we've got lots of folks saying, don't judge me. Lots of Christians might say, don't judge me. Now, I get that we're not judged for our sins. There is no uh, punishment for our sins at the final judgment, because if there were, it would be death. And by the way, Jesus died so that we wouldn't die. And there's therefore now no condemnation. But this is not talking about some sort of final judgment. Again, this is the referee. This is a judgment call. This is owning the discernment that is so healthy in a community. Do you not judge those who are within the church? Now, it's very interesting that this phrase, remove the wicked man from among yourselves, is quoted here. Because, I I love it, because in Deuteronomy 17, which it may come from, or Deuteronomy 21, which it also may come from, people are killed there. They're killed. They're stoned. Uh, They're they're killed, their life is terminated because they're living under the law, and the wages of sin is death. And yet, people ask all the time, what's the difference under the New Covenant? How is the Old Testament different from the New Testament if the Old Testament condemns sexual immorality and the New Testament condemns sexual immorality? What's the difference? Well, this passage answers that question. You ask... Well, what if I commit this sin? That's the difference. Under the law, not pretty. Under grace, you receive the discipline of the Lord. But discipline is training for the future, not punishment for the past. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died. There are no wages left. But there is a loving Father who cares deeply about our attitudes and actions. Amen? All right. Well, I I don't want to leave you without sharing how it all turned out. This is that man who struggled. This is that man who was obstinate and rebellious. Most scholars believe it's the same person being referred to. And here we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So that on the contrary, you should rather... Forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, check out this concern. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. And friends, we don't want that to happen. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. What does he want him to obey? He wants him to be obedient in loving this man. That's what he wants. He wants them to be obedient in embracing and accepting this man, not categorizing and labeling and dismissing this man as the sum total of his struggles, 
but recognizing his identity in Christ, we don't want him overwhelmed with guilt and excessive sorrow. I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. Tell him. Tell him you love him. Tell him you love him the same. Tell him that love has not changed. Embrace him. Reaffirm your love for him. That's what I want you to be obedient in. Now, is that not beautiful? Is that not incredible? Given what this man has done, and yet we look at all the abuses out there, and you see Paul's view, God's view of healthy discipline. Not a word we need to be scared of. Restorative, loving, caring. So what was the key concept that we saw today? Church discipline fosters healthy regret over sin, not excessive sorrow over failure. Big difference. Remember, there's good sorry, that healthy turning away from something that is harmful to you. There's good sorry, and then there's bad sorry. You're a sorry excuse, the accusation and condemnation of the enemy. And so the difference between good sorry and bad sorry, good sorry, I'm sorry for what I did. I regret it. I wish I hadn't done it. And bad sorry is, look at me. I'm just a sorry person. That's where the enemy wants you to go. Don't do it. That is not the Holy Spirit. That is not our Heavenly Father. You are not defined by your track record. You are holy and righteous and blameless. And so, I guess, I ask you this morning, next time you think about the word discipline, next time you think about reacting to someone's struggle, what are you looking for? Is there sorrow? Is there regret? Or is there an obstinance and an arrogance and a pride and an excuse making and saying this is of God and this is okay and this is no big deal? Because apparently... That criteria matters. Next time you think about God's discipline, is it something that you fear like punishment? Or will you choose to see? God's discipline is training for my future. It's not punishment for my past. If I got what I deserved for one single sin, it would be death. But Jesus took that in full, paid all the way, so that the only thing that is left is a God who remembers my sins no more, and yet cares deeply about my attitudes and actions. That's incredible. So next time you think about God's discipline, or even healthy discipline in a church community, I hope this passage helps you see things differently. The Father's smile, the Father's embrace, the Father's care, the Father's attention to every detail. Not to beat you over the head about your past, but to present to you a new and better future filled with His love and His care. What if the entire church saw this? Not just our body. What if the body of Jesus Christ all over the planet saw this and the abuses, the abuses they stopped? What if we started treating each other Not defining ourselves by what we've done. Not defining ourselves by our our past performance. But recognizing, look what he did, but he's holy. Look what he did, but he's a slave of righteousness. Look what he did, but look who he is. That's not him being himself. That's him acting like something that he's not. My heart goes out to him. I want restoration. I want to help him. That is the spirit, the true spirit of God's loving discipline. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your heart toward us, that you care so deeply about our attitudes and actions. Otherwise, imagine, Father, we just imagine you being like a new covenant computer, taking away our sins and then having nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our performance, nothing to do with our attitudes or actions. We don't want that. We're grateful for your attention. We're grateful for your leadership. We're grateful for your spirit living in us, for your counsel, your comfort, your guidance. 
We are totally forgiven, but sometimes we're totally clueless. And we're grateful, Father. Thank you for leading us. In Jesus' name, amen.